joining in worship. Uh, I hope that for those of you who can, um, you'll take every opportunity to join in on the um, non-Sunday events of the church. I draw your attention to bowling today at 2 o'clock for uh, those of you who are in Mike or Rachel Smogger, which kind of pretty much ends up being the singles of our church. So bowling today at 2 and then next Saturday. Uh, we have an opportunity to have uh, women meet for the first time to pray and worship and fellowship together. So I hope that you'll uh, use the QR code on your bulletins to sign up for that event. In his first Netflix special, comedian Michael Che talks about the gentrification of Brooklyn. He reminisces about the days when Brooklyn used to be scary. He grew up listening to rappers talk about what Brooklyn people would do to intruders, and he thought, man, this is a dope song, but I'm never going to Brooklyn. In this bit, he jokes about how white women took scary things like Brooklyn and made it theirs. White women take whatever they want, he jokes. They took Brooklyn. All of a sudden, a bunch of rich white women from Seattle said, Brooklyn's mine's now, and then they just owned it. He elaborates on how white women do this all the time. Taking a pit bull who used to fight in underground tournaments, they would sew a sweater for this pit bull, put it on him, and convince him to eat vegan snacks out of the palm of their hand. He imagines a brigade of white women being sent to Syria and having ISIS terrorists driven out by the rising rents as they gentrify Aleppo. Michael Che's comic assertion is that pioneering white women took over Brooklyn, coming in and remaking it to their liking. But that's not the real story. To me, it's the Korean-American small business owner that did more to transform Brooklyn. Before Whole Foods brought fresh produce to New Yorkers, it was the Korean greengrocer who went to Hunts Point to buy fruits and vegetables at 4 a.m., then trucked it to their stores in neighborhoods like Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Flatbush. They started their stores where the rent was cheap, where no one else wanted to uh, start a business in the shadows of violence and poverty. Some kept these stores open 24-7, working through the night in shifts as a family, and their efforts brought in goods and services, made the neighborhoods more livable, and improved property values. This gave the local government more resources with which to clean, beautify, and secure these neighborhoods. It wasn't always easy. There were racial tensions and between Korean-American store owners and their largely African-American customers, and black nationalist activists like Sonny Carson would organize strikes targeting Korean-owned businesses. But the situation eventually improved because the children, at least partly because the children of these Korean store owners were listening to Jay-Z and Biggie Smalls, and they helped their parents and customers see each other as neighbors in a common struggle. And these Korean business owners and the hardworking locals around them, they created the hustle culture, which brought out the struggling artist vibe in Brooklyn. And that's what made that neighborhood appealing for the white women Michael Che talks about. Sidewalk profits scribbling into their notebooks, retail workers registering all the side books, aged wise men leaning back on their wide stoops, pointed to the young and said, hey, let them cook. Dollar slice pizza fueled big city dreams. There was rhythm to the madness, remember what I mean. The hustle led to triumph for the creme de la creme, for the student, not the tourist. Old Brooklyn was a scene. And so when you think about what makes neighborhoods improve, what brings them from the ashes, it comes from a lot of people saying together, ask not what your neighborhood will do for you, ask what you can do for your neighbor. That is when God blesses his people to turn people around them into a blessing. In Brooklyn, in those uh, early decades when Korean Americans were pioneering there, some woke up to grind for prosperity. Others, the local neighbors, would often foster creative artistry. And the old heads from that neighborhood would cook for the community. And this made Brooklyn the place that pioneering white girls wanted to be in in the early 2000s, which led to the first Brooklyn Trader Joe's opening in 2008, and the first Whole Foods opening in 2013. The story of Brooklyn can be told as a story, or the story of recent Brooklyn, can be told as a story of a daughter of immigrants who was stuck stacking cans all weekend long in the 80s, who worked hard and got out to Stuyvesant and Stanford, but then when she could live anywhere, she came back and found that Park Slope felt like home. 
That's the American dream that I think all of us can get behind. For individuals to get out and level up, and then for neighborhoods to rise up and bring them back in again. But for this dream to become a reality, instead of picking our neighborhoods with a consumer mindset, we have to partner with our neighbors with a holy mindset. Before we look at our text, which tells us how to serve God in a way that will bless others and bring joy to our soul, would you take a moment to pray with me to ask God to bless the reading of his word? Dear God, we often separate serving you and helping ourselves. So we ask you to teach us what it means to live with faith so that as we dedicate ourselves to doing your will, we trust that we'll be made satisfied. Help us to live with joy, believing that we will not lose out on anything when we give our everything to you. Bless us so that we may choose devotion, so that others may see that serving you is the wisest way to live. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be made holy and pleasing to you, for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. God's word for us today is from Nehemiah, chapter 10, verses 31 through 32, and then verse 38 and 39. Then chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. We promise not to let our daughters marry the pagan people of the land and not to let our sons marry their daughters. We also promise that if the people of the land should bring any merchandise or grain to be sold on the Sabbath or on any other holy day, we will refuse to buy it. Every seventh year, we will let our land rest and we will cancel all debts owed to us. In addition, we promise to obey the command to pay the annual temple tax of one-eighth of an ounce of silver for the care of the temple of our God. A priest, a descendant of Aaron, will be with the Levites as they receive these tithes, and the tenth of all that is collected as tithes will be delivered by the Levites to the temple of our God and placed in the storerooms. The people and the Levites must bring these offerings of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms and place them in the sacred containers near the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the singers. We promise together not to neglect the temple of our God. The leaders of the people living in Jerusalem, the holy city, uh, the leaders of the people were living in Jerusalem, the holy city. A tenth of the people from the other towns of Judah and Benjamin were chosen by sacred lots to live there too, while the rest stayed where they were. And the people commended everyone who volunteered to resettle in Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. In our reading, we see that the Israelites are making major life decisions in a holy way. Who they will marry, how they will run their business, how they worship, even where they live, all of these decisions were made according to God's guidance. So would you say to the person next to you, 24-7, 24-7. Our calling is not to come here and give God an hour a week. Whether we eat or sleep, work or worship, whether we're spending time by ourselves or with others, we are to make every choice in a way that pleases God. And it's possible to devote our everything to God without becoming burnt out or bitter because of how good God's laws are, the path of obedience becomes the path of true blessedness. The holy choice becomes the healthy choice. The sacrificial way is the satisfying way. Let me begin with a choice about where we live. In Nehemiah 11, the question goes out, who wants to move to Jerusalem? The walls have recently been rebuilt, but now each neighborhood in the city must be rebuilt block by block and home by home. No one with a consumer mindset would want to go to Jerusalem at this time. When we're looking for a home with our typical mindset, we ask, how much space am I going to get? When was it last renovated? What does it look like? Who lives there? People that I vibe with, or am I going to feel awkward or unsafe? How are the schools? What is my commute time? In Nehemiah's day, a person in Israel thinking about moving to Jerusalem would have seen that the streets are clogged with burnt stones. The neighborhood is littered with empty lots. Every neighborhood institution needs to be remade from scratch. The resettlers wouldn't know who their neighbors were until they got there. Because it would require so much hard work and sacrifice, moving to Jerusalem was like 
becoming a tribute for the Hunger Games. You had to leave behind a more stable life and go into a place of high risk. So to repopulate the city, there was a draft. People were chosen by lots. One-tenth of the people had to go to Jerusalem. But some people, uh, they were chosen and asked to go by lot. But some people were like a Katniss Everdeen of their day, and they volunteered to take the place of another person who had been chosen. And chapter 11, verse 2 tells us, And the people commended everyone who volunteered to resettle in Jerusalem. And they did this because they all knew it would be so hard. In the rest of Nehemiah chapter 11, we get a long list of the honorable people who made the hard choice to go and rebuild Jerusalem. They are like the people who moved into Brooklyn in the early 70s or 80s. Through their hard work, their respect for each other, their desire to see a neighborhood rise up, they experienced the transformation of their neighborhood. Vacant lots became filled with green areas and playgrounds where everyone could enjoy. Dens of criminal activity became bustling areas of commerce. The streets became safe, and the laughter of children could be heard. If you want to go somewhere because it is already a good neighborhood, then how are you being any different from the people of the world? One way that we can express our faith is by choosing a neighborhood according to the gifts that God has given to us and to share them. Asking not, what will I get out of the neighborhood, but what can I give to this neighborhood is how we show Jesus to the world. Let me give you a few examples of people who make that kind of choice in determining where they will live. Pastor Tehu, missionary to North Philadelphia, picked the neighborhood to live in in a holy way. He looked at crime statistics, not to avoid crime, but to approach need. When there is a scary shooting in this neighborhood or a controversial arrest, he's out on the street helping his neighbors process these events. He is someone that looked at school test scores, not to be zoned for a great school, but to be in an under-resourced neighborhood. In addition to handing out backpacks filled with school supplies, he invites neighborhood children to come to the nearby church where he runs after-school programs. Um, I'm not sure if you know our friends Chris and Sarah. They recently moved from Plainview, and you haven't seen them in a while because they're now in Nicaragua. With their elementary school age kids, Joshua and Kayla, they are visiting the local schools, working with centers for children in need. Because instead of asking, where can our kids experience maximum safety and receive the best education, they were asking, where can our kids make the biggest difference and see God using them in a powerful way? Those questions led them to move to the city of Leon in Nicaragua with joy. And I want to just have that word echo in your minds, joy. Because Christianity is not a race to the bottom to see who can live in the most dangerous or impoverished neighborhood to prove that they are the holiest. Jesus carried his cross with joy because he knew that the Father would use his sacrifice to bless many. In the same way, when Abraham left Ur and then later Haran, the cities where he had settled, he left with joy because he believed God's promise. Faith is not a masochistic addiction to suffering, but the conviction that even when obedience requires us to suffer, that that path will lead towards satisfaction, glory, and allow us to leave behind a lasting legacy. Seek God's guidance, not just when you're deciding where to live, but after you unpack, pray daily, and ask God, how can I love my neighbors? If you pray for your neighbors in private, it will change how you interact with them in public. Serving God doesn't mean you put up obnoxious signs about controversial issues on your lawn. It means that you volunteer in the community, or you honor those who serve, or you try to gratefully enjoy all of God's blessings where you're at. The more you choose to serve God where you are, the more you will enjoy the place where you are. So would you say to the person next to you, love where you are. When you look for opportunities to serve your neighbors, God will bless you. In verse 2, 
we are told that people who volunteered to move inside Jerusalem, they were commended. But even after the applause died down, God's blessings over their life continued. You cannot outgive God. If you choose to go where God can use you, if you love others where God has planted you, then God will make you like a fruitful tree planted by streams of water. God will bless you to be a blessing, and your choice of where to live will display your faith. Your faith should also be displayed in the way that you choose a partner for marriage or the way that you approach singlehood. Let me read for you verse 30. The people said, We promise not to let our daughters marry the pagan people of the land, and not to let our sons marry their daughters. The context is, in that recent past, people in Israel had made alliances with the enemies of God through marriage. They drifted away from God by the way they pursued romance, and as they got married, they accepted bribes from their in-laws and betrayed their country, a problem that Nehemiah points out earlier. Back in the time of Nehemiah, the custom was that parents would arrange marriages for their kids. In our context, generally, individuals choose who they will marry. But no matter who is doing the choosing, Scripture tells us that every decision should be made to maximize our capacity to know God and to make God known. You should marry someone who will help you to know the way God loves you, who will partner with you to make God's character visible to the world. We dishonor God, and we weaken our community, and we cripple our capacity to leave behind a meaningful legacy if we approach marriage by asking, how can I get more honor or more security, more prosperity or more pleasure through marriage? We should not go into romance with a consumer mindset trying to find the best deal for ourselves. If we do, we will always be pretending and marketing ourselves to maintain an image of marriage without ever learning the substance of love. We will vent our frustration by becoming critical of our spouse or disappointed in their singleness. What we should be asking is, how can I give more of myself to God, either through marriage or through singlehood? The Apostle Paul celebrates celibacy. Let me say that again. Celebrate celibacy. Celebrate celibacy. You don't, they sound similar, but we don't usually think of those words together. Uh, celibacy is celebrated in Scripture as a wonderful way to live a life of full devotion to God. Freedom is great when it allows you to ask that open-ended question, God, how can I please you today? If you are serving God effectively as a single person, I promise that your single life will make many married people jealous. Your life will be full of growth. You will make many wonderful friends as you embrace the adventure of following God. During the Middle Ages, the monastic movement created structure for single men and single women to experience deep fellowship with each other while serving God with joyful abandon. Similarly, our church should provide community for our singles who seek to please God. We should spur each other on to love and good works, not to make ourselves more marketable for marriage, but to become fully what God wants us to be. Not everyone is called to marriage, but everyone is called to a life in community. When you don't have a purpose for your freedom beyond gratifying the pleasures of your flesh, then freedom becomes an existential burden. And so single people need support so that they can use their freedom to better love God. May God bless our singles ministry so that the singles of Adam Down English ministry will show the joy of being free to love God with abandon. Amen? Amen. We, we haven't really built anything yet, but I hope through something small like bowling and maybe following up with a lock-in in October, we'll slowly build community so that people who want to please God with their single years might be supported to do so. And if people get married, I don't tell them to live enviably. I tell them to live honorably. Your goal as a couple should not be maintaining the appearance of happily ever after, but the pursuit of holiness by becoming each other's accountability partner. 
helping each other embrace a life of pleasing God. Some say, marry your best friend. I say, marry someone who will help you be God's best friend. Amen? Amen. As a couple, your conversations with each other should not replace your prayer life. Talking to your spouse should make you more excited about talking to God. It says in Scripture that Moses talked to God the way a man talks to his friend. And that makes me think Moses' wife must have been pretty awesome because I find that the quality of my conversations with my wife will deeply impact the quality of my conversations with God. Talking to your spouse in a way that encourages your spouse to talk to God is how we honor God in marriage. Serve your spouse in a way that frees your spouse to serve God. Take delight in the quality of your spouse's service to God and the depth of your spouse's intimacy with God. When those are the things that you dream about for marriage, then your marriage will satisfy you more and more each passing year. You'll be able to look into each other's eyes, your cataract-filled eyes in later years, and say with gratitude and sincerity, it's better than ever. When I was single, I had more freedom than I do now in the way that I loved God and responded to God's call. But I also had many more delusions. I was excited about serving God, but I also got drunk off the feeling of being a hero in the eyes of others. So marriage was sobering in the best way. And now I feel that through my service, instead of drawing people to depend on me, I'm helping them connect to and know God. Before, I was serving unconsciously to build a reputation for myself, but marriage has purified the way I love God. Now, everything that I give to God requires my wife to sacrifice, and everything I give to serve my wife helps her to serve God. Thus, whatever I do for God is to my wife's credit, and whatever my wife does for God is to my credit. This understanding purifies both of our motives for service and helps us better discern what God is calling for us to do. And I hope our marriage makes single people in the church jealous. Couples can serve God with greater purity and discernment. And singles can serve God with greater abandon and freedom. And together we can love God in a way that makes one another jealous in this holy context. That's when the way we experience marriage or singlehood displays our faith to the world. Next in verse 31, we see that our faith should impact the way that we pursue business opportunities or make money. Verse 31, we also promise that if the people of the land should bring any merchandise or grain to be sold on the Sabbath or any other holy day, we will refuse to buy it Every seventh year, we will let our land rest, and we will cancel all debts owed to us. It is right to be responsible in our business and to seek to do well financially, but we should not pursue profit single-mindedly. We should think about long-term sustainability and do our work in a way that allows ourselves and others to rest on every holy day. Holy means set apart from work and dedicated to rest and the restoring of relationships. Every Sabbath day is holy. Every holiday is holy. It should be about rest, relating to God in worship, and connecting with each other in fellowship. If you have the power and authority to decide your schedule, insist on carving out time for worship, rest, and relationships. However, in biblical times, God's people were sometimes living as slaves or as exiles, and they could not decide to follow the Sabbath because they had to submit to those who ruled over them. But as much as it depends on us, we should promote a healthy culture towards work. This means that you become a good witness at work, not by working harder than others in our workaholic culture, but by being assertive about your needs and setting boundaries for when you can and cannot be available. Set times for self-care and devotion to God, and with the time remaining, ask God to help you 
deliver excellence to your clients or boss. Believe that if you spend more time in Sabbath, that you will waste less time on procrastination because you will have greater motivation and less anxiety. And that is how you display your faith through your work. Your faith should also be displayed, of course, in the way you worship. Verse 32. In addition, we promise to obey the command to pay the annual temple tax of one eighth of an ounce of silver for the care of the temple of our God. They were called to think about religion as a way of being able to give to God. So don't choose a church based on the services that are offered to you. It doesn't matter that much whether you like the sermon or your family members like the programs. Choose a church where you believe that your money, your time, and your energy is being given to God. What does it feel like when you give at church? Does it feel like that the more you give, you're only inflating the ego of the pastor? Then you have to ask God when you're giving your offering, God, is this going to you? And you should ask your leaders, how does my sacrifice and participation in these programs honor God? Ask, what's the point of our organization existing? Would it be any different for our neighbors if we cease to exist? If you don't feel like God is being served by your participation at church, then you need to find another church. If this is something that you struggle with, recognize it is a serious problem that requires decisive action. I know people who are serving churches where they have no friends, where they're like the only person of their generation. They're worshiping in a language they don't fully understand, and I wonder, why are you a member there? And they respond, I feel God is pleased with my decision to serve at this church. Here, I believe that God is receiving my service and my worship. And they remind me that church membership should not be chosen based on what we get, but what we're able to give. One way you can determine whether your giving is going to God is by examining the lives of the pastors at the church. Verse 38 says, A priest, a descendant of Aaron, will be with the Levites as they receive these tithes, and the tenth of all that is collected as tithes will be delivered by the Levites to the temple of our God and placed in the storerooms. This means that the people who are supported by the offering of the rest of the people, they're also supposed to give. I take these verses to mean that as a pastor, I'm also supposed to tithe, and that tithing is symbolic. By giving this portion, I'm saying to God, God, all of my life is yours. Because the church is not a business. The pastor should not be motivated to increase our market share so that we can get more for our, ourselves. The church exists for God. And anyone who works at church should do so to please God. If you question whether your pastors are working with selfish ambition or with a holy dedication, then talk to them. Ask, why are you a pastor? Ask, why did you choose to serve here? Every pastor should always be ready to respond to questions like that. But when you ask, please take the time to pray for love to fill your heart because when pride is your motive, your questions can hurt the church. But when fear is your motive to be silent, then your silence can also hurt the church. In everything, we must be motivated by a love for God and a love for each other to make sure that God receives everything at church. The final verse in today's passage is verse 39. The people and the Levites must bring these offerings of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms and place them in the sacred containers near the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the singers. They said together, we promise together not to neglect the temple of our God. So if you are not a Christian, you're just here to kind of check things out, I'm sorry this message is not really for you. But if you are a Christian, and you're wondering, what does it mean for me to say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, then don't just ask what the church can do for you. Ask God what you are called to do for the church. Then if you need the church to help you to do what God is asking you to do, then you ask the church for help. 
Perhaps you feel that God is asking you to receive more counsel and mentoring so that you can be healthy, so you can be better equipped to serve God with your life. Then ask for resources. If you think that it will help, ask for me to invest in you, spend time with you, praying with you. If you feel that counseling would help, we are a part of a counseling network. We can lean into those resources together. If you feel that Bible study would equip you to teach others the Bible, come and ask for help in these ways. We might not be able to give you exactly what you need, but as a church, we can research and help you find the tools that will allow you to be of more use to God. Perhaps you are here feeling frustrated because you feel culturally marginalized in this mostly Korean church. You are wondering, should I stick or really invest here? I hope that you will stay and stick it out even when you don't feel that you're getting exactly what you need here. Because I believe God will not just make translations of Korean programs available for you, but will make culturally appropriate discipleship available so that you will be equipped to serve God effectively. If you feel that there is currently a ceiling on how much you can give to God in leading this church because of language or culture, then I encourage you to stick, invest, and pray so that every member that God calls to Adam Down Church will be able to give their best to God. Maybe you're frustrated because you don't have kids and you feel marginalized because everything at a church seems to revolve around parents and kids. Let's pray for your growth and God will lead us and give us ideas to equip you to serve God more effectively. Please be here when you feel that the church is changing in ways that you didn't expect or want. Because even when you feel unsupported, even when you feel like nothing is coming to you, be here because all of us should be here wondering how can we give our all to God. When God takes our hard work and uses it according to God's plans, that is when churches change, communities change, and countries change. Knowing that we serve a mighty God who promises to do great things with us, would you join me in gladly volunteering and giving of ourselves? Would you pray with me? God, we want holiness to be displayed not just in this hour of worship, but in our 24-7. God, in every major decision that we make, in the way that we pick neighborhoods to live in, in the ways that we form families, the ways that we build businesses, the ways that we participate in church life, make us holy in all of these decisions so that we can discover that embracing your will leads to satisfying service and spiritual growth. God, sometimes people assume that Christians are just like everyone else. They assume that our organization is self-serving and that our faith is primarily selfish. But God, would you help us to display that because you are so good, committing to obedience of your will, even when it seems to lead us into suffering, that it leads us to our highest good because you use all of our suffering to unite us to yourself and lift up your name and cause us to be a part of your blessing. God, would you help us to resolve to stop asking so much what I'm getting out of things. Would you help us to take the attitude of giving so that we can see you work in powerful, transformative ways. These things we pray in Christ's name.